Okay, let's uh, let's go ahead and do this. Uh, start talking about this stuff. So, so today, what I'd like to talk about is actually running experiments. And I've got I've got a couple of different weird little uh, in class activities that hopefully we can uh, uh, we, we can kind of collaboratively uh, work on. Ah, uh, so what what makes science science? I mean, I, I have this, this assertion that uh, if you can run controlled experiments, you have science, and if you can't, it's not science. That's really true. <laughs> it, it's, it's actually very tough to run experiments uh, in some other fields. So in particular, like uh, cosmology, if we could just actually bake up a couple you know, uh, million universes, that would make it much easier to kind of understand like what, uh, you know, what, 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 what aspects of the world around us are kind of random and what aspects are really key to making physics work. And, you know, no easy way to do that. Uh, one of my friends in uh, uh, Seattle works in the experimental astronomy lab, uh, and they do simulations of you know, and formation of stars and galaxies and you know, planets and all sorts of interesting things. So computer science is a heck of a lot easier. And actually, in particular, there's some things that are super duper easy to measure. Like it's uh, anything you can get a number from the computer out of fairly easy. I, I'm, gonna, I'm calling this easy. We'll see how hard some of these things are. But like, if I want to know how many, how much time it takes to do something, there are timers that are very accurate. I can run experiments that cost me basically nothing. Uh, and and this is really different. So uh, it it, uh, it always strikes me thinking about uh, people in other fields. So for example, if, if you're interested in understanding how nuclear reactions work, unfortunately. Uh, 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 it's actually very difficult to run many of these experiments, right? Well, one of the big reasons the things that's stopping us from being able to do fusion is the fact that we don't we don't totally understand the you know a, a lot of the actual reactions that happen in fusion, in particular those side reactions and things. So, uh, in, in particular, like in the 1940s when they're figuring these things out, in order to figure out how you know nuclear reactions work, you have to actually take this extremely rare, valuable material and explode it, which not not an easy thing to, to pull off. And of course, you really got to make sure you're going to collect all the data you can collect before you do your one little test, because that's maybe all the uranium you got. That's all the uranium in the world, maybe, that, uh, that you, just, you just used. And now it's scattered across the desert and transmuted in other elements. And that's uh, it's not the way it is in computer science. We can repeat experiments. I mean, computers are designed to be predictable. The, that predictability has kind of been failing. Like, what does it, so uh, if I'm going to do a controlled experiment and measure the number of nanoseconds, I claim that this has gotten way harder in the last 20 years in computing. Why, why is that? Parallel, parallel matters too. So, so you look at a typical computer from 20 years ago, or a typical personal computer. And so, my personal computer from 20 years ago, it, it ran at eight megahertz, right? Uh, eight, eight million cycles per second. And uh, but the weird part about it is that was the clock rate that was built from the factory. It ships at eight megahertz. It's going to you click on the on button. It's running at eight megahertz all the time. And machines don't do that today. So because of things like dark silicon, right, the, uh, we, can, we can melt the chip if we switch too fast. Right? If we have too many transistors flipping, the chip is going to melt. So we, we limit the number of transistors we're going to, we're, we're, that are going to be flipping. The easiest way to do that is just to drop the clock rate down. So, so like my, my laptop is probably idling along at megahertz, right? Maybe like 20 years old uh, clock rate. It can run at gigahertz, but it doesn't all the time, just like it doesn't sprint all the time. Uh, uh, because then it would it would melt. So it so, so was, it clock rates really vary, which is kind of odd. And, and in fact, uh, I, I've certainly seen cases where I, I run I run the experiment one time and it's fairly fast. I run it two times and it's faster. I run it three times and it's really fast. I run it ten times and it starts slowing down again. Like so, so this is where the you know the clock rate starts off low. As soon as the CPU sees that it's actually doing some work, it clocks itself up and is really excited. And in fact, it can overclock itself briefly, but then it has to you know drop back down to keep thermal under control. So if, if you have thermal headroom, you can overclock. Uh, if you want to save you know idle power, you can clock yourself down. So so the, this this makes nanoseconds really kind of flexible. Now one weird part about this is nanojoules might actually be a lot more stable. So, so, so uh, uh, look at the amount of energy it takes to run a computation. Uh, it's it's you know the time times the power of the uh, the, the power that the machine is currently drawing. 
Uh, so so if, if the machine is clocked way down, it's actually doing that just to burn less power. And, and in particular, if, if it takes a certain number of like transistors flipping to get a computation done, then uh, the, the nanojoules might be a more accurate measure of how, uh, how much energy it takes to do that. Um, machines don't report their instantaneous energy usage very accurately or at all, most of them. So sometimes this one is hard to, hard to get out. But that, that might, this, might, this is probably the new, the new thing we should, we should be using. Uh, if you want to know how much memory your program is using, how do you do that? Windows box, control, alt, delete, task manager, look at the memory column. That's, that's unfortunately usually a fairly coarse estimate. So if, if you look, for example, at uh, the, our, I'm just going to do top, the Linux equivalent. So it says Chrome right now is using, well, somewhere between uh, 3 gigs and 1 gig. So, so what, what's this? So th this has also gotten a lot harder in the past uh, 20 years. Used to be memory is memory. It just is what it is. Nowadays, of course, you have vert and res. What are they? Yeah, so the, the virtual memory is sort of how much memory you could theoretically be using. And that's not how much you're actually using. Res is the resident memory that's actually loaded in. So, so for example, if I've got a giant, it, it, Chrome is like 100 megs or something, some ridiculously huge executable. Uh, but it's got big chunks of that, like you know, three megs are to render read in these fonts. I'm not doing any of that, so that is just sitting on disk, not loaded. But there's sort of space, there's address space available for it, so it counts as virtual memory. But it's not actually using burning real RAM, so it's not in red, the resident. So, uh, uh, so you, you can so, so easy enough to get a really coarse operating system level estimate of how much memory you used. Uh, that there are there are, so this, these are usually links to uh, ways to get that that uh, info. So malinfo will tell you like the number of bytes that are not mapped using nmap. So I call malloc. It's going to either give me nmap space like separately allocated uh, pageful block, right? or, or it's going to be somewhere in the heap. So this is sort of the heap allocated uh, space. Uh, th th these are the MMAP regions that it may have uh, allocated. Usually, it just does it for big allocations. So, so you can get really gory detail. Uh, oftentimes, this is kind of a subset of the operating system. So, so, so the operating system says, like, virtual is a gig, uh, resident is half a gig. Uh, this might say quarter gig. It's a little weird. What's the difference? Point. So this does include programs executable code. So if I got 100 meg executable and, and you know 50 megs are loaded in, then that's that's definitely something that's not measured here. This is true of almost any way I can get numbers out of a machine. Right? The number is going to include some stuff uh, that I want, include some other stuff I don't want. So for example, malinfo is going to tell me the number of free chunks, which is kind of a weird tip tool. Malloc doesn't actually give memory all the way back to the OS when you free it. Uh, oftentimes. It doesn't have to. Uh, so in fact, it may just uh, keep that memory around so that it can more quickly hand you, uh, hand you memory when you allocate uh, you know, something. Again, in particular, I mean, a lot of programs do like malloc-free, malloc-free, malloc-free on the same size buffer. If they're, you know, a person connects to the web server, you allocate a little struct to represent their connection. Uh, as soon as you're done talking to them, you free the buffer. Well, the next person that connects is going to have to allocate a buffer. And it's going to be the same size, and it's... Uh, uh, Malik, Malik's basically whole job is to recycle that stuff. So, it, so, so, uh, it, so, so this includes free information, which maybe I don't want to count because I freed it, right? But that's, uh, so some of it maybe I'm going to reallocate, uh, but, but some, some of it I won't. In particular, Malik almost always hangs on to random stuff that I know I will never want again. I allocated a buffer at startup to read the, the config file. I'm never going to read the config file again. I read it. It's, uh, it's done, man. Uh, so, so, so uh, that's that, that's in there, and and this is this is where these things always get complex, right? So it's it's very easy to get numbers, 
<laughs> machines are great at giving you numbers. They're packed and jam-packed with numbers. But the numbers aren't always meaningful. And in particular, the, the, there's often these caveats on like, well, you know, I can look at the OS level memory usage, and that tells me one fraction of what's really happening on the machine. Or I can look at the malloc level memory usage, and that ignores the stuff that I didn't that didn't go through malloc, like an explicit MMAP, or you know, the uh, the virus that went in and allocated a tumor inside my memory space. I mean, it, uh, lots of lots of weird, crazy things can happen there. Uh, this is particularly bad when you look at like network stuff, because like um, my my server latency, I ping a server, it comes out a certain certain number of milliseconds. Like this is uh, this is a bunch of stuff. So I, I ping lawler.cs. Can't ping lawler.cs because I'm on internal network. <laughs> the internal network doesn't do ping for some reason. Uh, how about time? Uh, SSH lawler. Oh, and I, I think this is pretty, okay. Hey, so three second ping. What's in that three seconds? That, that's, that's a long time to get down the hallway. Application. SSH is doing crypto, and it's doing some pretty wacky crypto in there. You, I didn't have to enter a password because I have like an elliptic curve private key stored on my machine that matches the elliptic curve public key stored on that machine, which means that both of them are doing wacky mathematics to make that work. That's all baked in there, right? So, so and, and uh, unfortunately, a lot of network latency often includes baked in time to do lots of other wacky things. So that, uh, uh, my, my suspicion is that the underlying time is, uh, let's see, how about I trace root? So, oh, that, that works for some reason. Okay, so so to get from, so, so again, I'm, I'm plugged into the network here, but, uh, Show. Let's see. So I, I, I am on the private network, which is kind of interesting. But the private network apparently is bridged probably right over at the uh, uh, in, in the network closet, bridged right over to the uh, the public network, which is where Lawler.cs lives. So this is uh, so so you know it's half a millisecond. So so, so the wacky part about this is I I, I mean my time. Um, this is crazy too. So to get to the router on the uh, UAF subnet is slower than getting to lawler.cs, which is behind the router. For some reason. Normally these numbers are ascending, but in this case they're not ascending. Why, why not? So it's quite possible this router, which is probably a Cisco, is configured to be really fast for routing packets. That's his job, back and forth, routing packets. But to respond to, a, actually here it's like, I guess, a tracer at root is like I comp timeout. So TTL hits zero, uh, then the, the that super fast packet routing hardware is like, TTL just hits zero. I don't know, and it hands it up to this the crazy slow, like megahertz scale CPU that's supposed to handle all the weird crap, right? And I, you buy a Cisco because it's supposed to route packets really fast back and forth. Right? The, the network latency for communicating might be really low. But the, the network latency for pinging the router itself, like who cares, right? But uh, people are not, uh, not, not concerned about that. The, the, it, it's the same deal if you, you know, uh, if you use the actual configuration interface in the router, you might be talking to a really slow CPU that's connected to a really fast packet switching dedicated hardware circuit that does. It's just, so, I have no idea if that's what is. Is it repeatable? So uh, here's some mystery, right? Like, why is it why is it faster to get to Lawler.cs than it is to get to the gateway that lets me talk to Lawler.cs? And that's that's weird. Uh, if I trace it again, happens again. Okay, it happens until it starts dropping packets on me, and and it uh, so so that looks really repeatable. Right? I, 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 so I, I tried the experiment a few times. Uh, it actually seems to be getting faster to talk to a lot about CS proper, at least when it works. So, huh, there's a mystery. Uh, virtually any time you get numbers out of the machine, you actually encounter all of these strange mysteries. So, so uh, th this latency is appallingly good, actually, right? 0.15 milliseconds. That's, uh, that's, that's excellent. So if, if you compare it to, for example, I'm going to trace her up to 8.8.8.8. .8 so this is Google's poor overloaded global, uh, global name server. And at some point, uh, some, somebody uh, dropped the icon packet. 
So it's, it's a long dang way from somewhere inside the UAF network uh, to the UAF public network to probably to Seattle or something would be one of these long uh, links. And then uh, I, I don't know if they have a data center in Oregon or, uh, or where, but 47 milliseconds seems semi-plausible to get out up to some other organization. I guess if I, I could trace her out to the ACS homepage or something, uh, ACS, if that's really, uh, it's actually probably ACS Alaska. AlaskaCommunications.com. So they're in like the, and of course they're, you know, somebody is dropping bad icon packets there, and that's, that's, it's uh, not like a pass there, but okay, eight milliseconds to get, maybe, that's maybe the anchorage or something. Uh, but but uh, uh, millisecond on the latency, which is great, but uh, we, we, we have uh, this mystery that when I, when I do an SSH, it takes on the order of seconds. How repeatable, I mean, re re repeat, repeat the experiment, it took two seconds before. Ah, uh, so again, anytime you look at numbers, you actually, uh, in particular, timing tends to include lots of gory details in the system that you may not care about otherwise. Uh, the first time I ran this, it was two point something seconds. It is not two point something seconds now. Why, why did it get almost 50% faster? If you compare to like uh, time w get say lower.cs is running a, a web server, <laughs> I mean the web server can give me a web page in five milliseconds, which makes sense because it's like fractional millisecond to do packets back and forth. And 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 this probably gets faster too once. Uh, oh no, it got slower. Okay, nope, fast again. Uh, so if, if fastest time is three, so uh, what, what the heck, right? Uh, what was happening this moment when it, uh, that? I have no idea. This is what makes science hard, right? Uh, can, can we speculate as to what might delay operations on that server for 60 milliseconds? Could be there was a million people hit that site briefly. Yeah, uh, the, the, the server is serving like my home page, which gets like no traffic, uh, and uh, uh, net run, which does get hit a couple hundred times a day. So I don't know. Maybe somebody was in there doing net run. Maybe the uh, it, 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 one of the weird parts about networks is that they will drop packets. Even like a really local network like this will lose packets. So if uh, if I go bing bang 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 bang. Uh, right, uh, uh, do, do, do the through the handshake with TCP, send my request, get the data back, hang up. It, 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 if, if all the packets make it, uh, my network is so tiny here, it doesn't take any time at all. If one of the packets is lost, right, so bing, bang. At some point, who, who, you know, whoever's expecting the, the boom will do a retransmit and say like, uh, hey, it's, it's, uh, we're talking here. And then, right, the, the whole thing will finish. So it's possible it's a lost packet. I have no idea. You could, if I was capturing packets, you'd be able to explain if you, if you care. Uh, this is a really common problem with timing information. Uh, so you can see, like, sometimes it's three, so most of the time it's like four or five, right? So I've got this nice little distribution of obeys beautiful uh, normal statistics, right? But in particular, it's like a normal distribution. Some of a lot of little uh, uh, little deviations, and then every once in a while something completely off the radar happens. Right, so th this is your site's been slash dotted. The network is down, in which case it takes an hour to get communication instead of a millisecond. Uh, so, so, so the problem is a statistical model is based on this, and, and in particular, one of the things about a normal distribution is that the, the, uh, the the normal distribution tails off, which is, seems accurate, right? There's some probability that these, you know, high, high variance things happen. 
The problem is that it tails off at an exponential rate. And most real-world systems have non-exponential long tails, in particular in the long, uh, out, uh, out here. Uh, so so if, if in particular, if I'm looking at time versus network latency, that, that there are, so any time I collect numbers, the expectation is we're going to uh, be able to apply some statistical modeling here. And the default, everybody's default statistical model seems to be it's a normal distribution, which really bugs me sometimes. <laughs> In particular, a normal distribution has tails that extend to infinity in both directions. The tails get too skinny on one side. <coughs> uh, normal distribution tells you the probability that uh, I receive the packet, or I receive the web page several milliseconds before I send the request is not zero. In particular, if you figure out the area under these curves, you might say, well, yeah, 1% of the time, we do expect to receive the web page before we send the request for it. How often do you receive a web page before you send the request for the web page? It's not one percent of the time. It basically doesn't occur. I mean, it, uh, if, if many many things have to be really broken for a web page to spontaneously send you a, uh, a, a server spontaneously sends you the web page and you you receive it before you send the request. That that like. I shouldn't say can't happen because, I mean, a lot of cosmic rays got to flip a lot of bits and a lot of pieces of software before you will actually successfully receive the web page before you send the request for it. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's probably not zero, but it's definitely not as high as the, uh, you know, the exponential fall off tells you it should be. So on one side, we're way too big. On the other side, we're way too small, right? So, so in particular, we saw a 69, so we saw a 69 millisecond uh, request, whereas the mean is like four milliseconds. And do uh, what? Okay. Uh, how do you collect data? So I'm I'm, I'm doing the easy one. Uh, so here, this is very easy, right? I collect. There was another 94. So it's usually three or four milliseconds. So clearly, I don't want to have to uh, manually do this. I I, or I, I should say. I, apparently, I've just I, I've collected 21 data items that are now scattered in my terminal history. It's the only place these numbers are stored. So I can scroll back through my terminal history and carefully write these things down as if it's like the Middle Ages and I'm a scribe trying to hand transcribe the tablets, right? Uh, we have computers. I highly recommend automating your performance collect data collection if you can. It's often a uh, pain in the butt, but, uh, but you should still do it anyway. <laughs> How do I automatically or repeatedly get the web? And uh, here's the other problem: is that uh, anytime, anytime I want to repeat an experiment, I'm going to get different results than if I did not repeat the experiment. So, so in particular, like the the first time I did an SSH connection, it, I, I haven't done that from this laptop or to that server for a few days. Pre presumably, the all the code that does it is off on disk. That server does. Uh, it's got a spinning metal disk. It doesn't even have an SSD. So the first time I do an SSH connection, it's going to be ridiculously slow. Right? It's got to load in the code from disk. It's got to get it all, you know, uh, load into memory. I, I know for like the elliptic curves, it builds a big table of powers of the elliptic curves. So that's the first thing it has to do is build, the, uh, build those. And then once it's done all that work, everything's set up, everything's loaded in RAM. And then if I do it again, it's much faster. So this is, and this is true for a lot of a, a lot of these things. But the, the, that first hit latency can be can be pretty big, uh, and, and then we'll get these weird random latency spikes. They're caused by unknown events. So, I, uh, so my automated testing, I probably ought to not just flood the machine with requests. That, that actually often will end up breaking other things. Like you run out of TCP ports because you've done 65,000 requests in the two-minute TCP uh, uh, port number release window. So, so maybe I do a request, wait a second, do a request, wait a second. That's, that's cool, but I'm going to wait a fraction of a second. So how do I do that? I, I would like to collect performance data, but I would like to not have to do it by hand. So, so some, some flavor of scripting language would be handy for this. So yeah, so a, a Python, a Perl, a, a, I always do Bash for some awful reason. Is it, uh, how easy is it to do timing in Python? Super easy. Oh, 
Okay, cool. Uh, you may have to walk me through this. Or, uh, you call a function called time. Right, okay, time. Like, cool. What is it? Is it milliseconds? I think it's no, milliseconds or something. <laughs> uh, it's on the Seconds, it can probably give you a full second. Sure. Sure. All I know is it doesn't yeah. give you some weird chrono object, so <laughs> I'm pretty happy about that. Time, I have to import, like import time. From time, import time. Okay, and uh, right. Okay, fractional. It looks like that's integer seconds, or that's that's seconds, but it's not integer. That's, that's good. So yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. So that that seems pretty easy then. So I'm gonna. Uh, uh, nice. Okay. I should not be doing this in my home directory because there's just way too much stuff in my home directory. So I should be in the class. Yeah. Yeah. So this is uh, so this is actually performance experiments, and uh, it's, it's considered good practice to kind of put the uh, time and date on it. So uh, so I've got a directory now that has uh, everything. And uh, before I forget, I'm going to remove those 21 index.html's. I guess I'm going to be making index.html's. Oh man, I really want to write a shell script because that's just my default go-to for this stuff. So uh, let's see. so I guess I, we can do. Uh, t uh, so this is web time. Do you do file name extension .py? Mm -hmm. Sure. So uh, import time. Should I import time from time? From time, import time. Is that how you do it? Yes, no, I do it. Right. Uh, how do I run uh, like a system command? So if, at some point, I'm going to do like a system uh, get. Yeah, so you can do it from OS import system. And uh, th that's going to output index.html, so I'm going to just rm index.html. Mm, the only thing about system. Is, is that the one I should use? Yeah, system is a little weird. I mean, if you want to do a web request, you can do like a, mm -hmm. you can do a web request in Python. Using yeah. Python yeah. requests. Well, I'm, I'm okay with calling. So, so in general, right, I want to call some system commands yeah. to do something. Yeah. yeah. Is, um, there are downsides, actually. wget is probably going to like repeat the name lookup because it you know, starts up a new wget from scratch. We can try it. I'm not sure how, yeah. the, how the timing will work mm. with that. Because in my experience, mm. like at least if you, if you print something, maybe it's just the printing that's weird, but if you print something and then you do a system call and then you like print something else, that print like does or not necessarily happen in that order. Mm -hmm. Like you usually, I think yeah. the Python stuff prints out and then the system stuff prints out. What uh, uh, sure does the system, system start this extra command running, or does it start it and wait for it to finish? Yeah, that's a good question. I'm not sure the way to So I, I guess uh, uh, the, the other other thing we should do is look at wget. So it's probably got a quiet. I mean, it was spewing a bunch of crap to the screen, so I don't want that. So I'm just gonna make it. Not print anything, so hopefully. And uh, yeah, I, I, I'm going to leave the indexes in place for now, and, and just verify that we get a. a so, uh, can't tell you how many times I've constructed some really bizarre uh, way to run a piece of code so for timing, and I get some timing data. And I think like this timing data is sure weird, but okay, and then you know make decisions based on that. And then I realize like. What I was timing was the time to get into the library, realize the arguments are wrong, return an error code, take that error code, do nothing with it. Like that was not the time. That was like that was a bad experiment. That was not uh, not timing things. Was interested in. So I, I kind of want to make sure wget is going to work. And it's not that like you know system is not doing it or is, is failing somehow. Uh, so I, I have a timer and I have a command I want to time. So I'm, I'm hoping before I run system, I can look at the clock. Run system and I look at the clock again, and how long the clock has elapsed is how long it really took. So we'll we'll see if that uh, that works. So so the, the start time is my time, and elapsed time is the uh, the current time minus the start time. In theory. So now if I uh, if I just print that, is there a way to limit the number of decimal places?
Is it printf? That would be cool. No, that's right. Oh, okay. Uh, Float has no attribute three F. Didn't didn't like it. Well, I can I can live without uh, nice decimal places. So I'll I know do this. Do it, so. Okay, so that looks like uh, so that these are in seconds now. Apparently, it looks like five milliseconds, and then presumably we're getting yeah, index.html's are spewing out here. Let me make sure that one of them is okay. Looks correct. Okay, so we're. We're pulling down a tiny web page from a local server. So I want to run that how many times? And I guess I do want to remove it. So re re repeat, right? So this is basically just, uh, oh, I should know how to do this. For uh, n for range. Instead of colon, it's going to be n. Unfortunately, the range-based four is there in like JavaScript, C++, etc., and the syntax is all run together. You'll need a colon after the for loop. I remember there was a colon somewhere in there. Yeah, and if you leave off the colon, weird things happen. Ah, uh, okay. So let's see if this works. Okay, it looks like I got some numbers. Ah, uh, I'm kind of so. Uh, question one, I guess, is. Uh, are these numbers plausible? There's a whole lot more threes than there were when we ran it manually. Yeah, there's one six. That's the biggest, it seems like. Uh, but 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 who knows? Uh, so, what uh, what am I doing here that was different from when I was running them manually? Because somehow I'm getting. I mean, it's mostly threes. And when it, when I did it myself, uh, I did ls and home dear. That was a bad idea. So I got some threes, but I got some fives, got some fours, got some sevens, got a sixty nine for some reason. What what's different? Right? It was it seemed like it was mostly generally slower before running it manually. I was doing w get before. Now I, I realized one difference is uh, I did not say quiet. So it, it, and it's, it's possible, get, especially here with the crazy fast network and tiny static web page, that most of the time, or like uh, there's an appreciable amount of time spent doing the printouts. And I've definitely found that to be the case. Actually, there's I found libraries where when I comment out the debug code, like that's spewing you know, everything about the library, everything it's doing, the library gets like 10 times faster <laughs> because it was just doing simple floating point stuff. And now it's doing floating point stuff without screwing through the screen. So, I don't know, let's see if, see if that makes any difference. Uh, this, this is going to cause the problem that uh, the screen is going to be filled with crap and num and measurements. I mean, you can save your measurements to like a list or something. Yeah, I've, uh, so, let's see, so, so, so several ways to do this. Uh, so, so this is like a ms to get a page. So, uh, is, is, it, is the plus going to work there? Do I need a comma? Or? No, work. Okay. So, uh, so I just need to grep for man. Oh, you'll probably have to run a stir on the elapsed. You stir elapsed. So it won't do Okay, let's see if that works. Okay, uh, I'm seeing a 4, I'm seeing a 3.9, I'm seeing a 3.4, there's a 4. I think, I think that it looks like it was part of it. Now, unfortunately, I've got this mix of random crap in my output. So here, here's what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that, uh, so the uh, easy way to do this is pipe to log. And, uh, oh, that, that, that may have been enough, so let's see what's in log. Uh, the log, log is up too. Don't be guys use everything to standard error. So let, let's see what the numbers look like. So we got a three. Oh my gosh. Got a two. Got a, got a huge one in there. So the, the big one the arrived. So okay, so I, I got a hundred numbers. What do we do with the hundred numbers? Well now we... Uh, how, how, do, how do you figure out what the numbers are telling you? This is kind of the next stage in data analysis. 
can just grab them and see what they are. I can, I can grab them. What, what, uh, what do I use to graph them? I know there's a Python library for this. I don't know how to use it. I would have to look that up. Let's go back to and in particular, I, I don't know what the numbers are telling me. I don't know how I want to scale it, modify it. I, I, I just, I, I want to, I want somewhere where it's very easy for me to change the processing of the numbers. So I, I feel like the, the uh, my, my personal favorite for this is to drop this stuff into a spreadsheet. And I, I feel like I've actually figured out more things about my data looking at a spreadsheet than I have in, uh, uh, in in programs themselves, so so I, I'm I'm gonna uh, let's see. I'm gonna make you do this because uh, I think I've been talking for too long. So I'm gonna I'm gonna call this this is the uh, uh, web timing data. So the raw data, right there. That did not work right. So the, 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 these are unfortunately not numbers. And um, maybe this is a place where Google. Okay, if 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 I paste that into to LibreOffice, uh, the spreadsheet part. Some regular spreadsheet. So uh, as as soon as I do a paste, it it wants to know. Oh, wacky. Uh, if if I paste from plain text, okay. So the, the, there, I think it was contaminated with uh, the web or something. So paste from plain text in a spreadsheet. There we go. Uh, te text is, so, so this is great, because this lets me parse this thing arbitrarily. And by default, it uses tab to separate uh, the different columns in the spreadsheet. So here, I can just say, uh, uh, separate them with a space. So now, suddenly, all my numbers are in one column, which, of course, is what I want. And then I get some extra random columns. I, I didn't need any of these because I ended up not having to like grep my data out. Uh, so I'm going to grab that column. I'm going to switch to the spreadsheet that you all have access to. So, and I'm just going to paste everything right in there. So this is like milliseconds to get page. Uh, that's actually seconds to get the page. Okay, okay, uh, units, super important. Literally, spacecraft have rammed into planets because units were wrong. and. Uh, it always gets blamed on like you know imperial versus uh, metric, but man, if you think it's in kilogram force and it's in newton force, like same exact problem. Ah, uh, you you have access to this Google sheet. T tell me about this. Tell me, sing me the song of this data. You, you ideally would have a computer. <laughs> So form into groups. 